Hello there, all you fans of the Eastern Border Podcast. If you've been enjoying this show, chances are you're the kind of history buff who's interested in not just what's happened in the past, but also why. The role of ideas and beliefs in history is huge, isn't it? You can't tell the story of the Soviet Union without it. In fact, one of the many things that makes the Cold War so fascinating is that both sides had a whole body of ideas influencing what their people and their governments did, how they saw the world and their place in it. If this sort of thing is your cup of tea, then be sure to check out Inward Empire, a podcast about this exact link between ideas and actions in American history. I haven't touched the Cold War yet, but rest assured I'll get there one of these days. And in the meantime, you can start with Sword of the Wilderness, a story about colonization, identity, and war. Available through the iTunes store or at inwardempirepodcast.podomatic.com. Greetings, Tavarishi, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Some personal announcements, and then we'll move on to Gorbachev, or how they affectionately sometimes call him here, Gorby. First off, to all the nice people who are listening to us in iTunes, please leave us a nice review, we would greatly appreciate that. And don't forget to visit our website, theeasternborder.lv, to see all the pictures that we're adding to complement each episode. And you can also find our contact information there and contact us with any questions or criticism that you might have. We have so far answered all of them, I think. And remember, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Secondly, we have opened a Patreon account now, so you can support us there. The link will be in the show notes and is also on our website. Or if you don't know what Patreon is or are too busy to go to our site and would like to support our show, visit patreon.com slash the eastern border. That is patreon.com slash the eastern border to both learn about their service and to support this podcast. And, of course, thank you to Mark Sands and James Mitchell, who have already done so. You're the best guys. We wouldn't be able to do it without your support. And finally, for this time, in February, there is just going to be a single episode, not two. Because... We have spotted our some errors in our earlier podcasts. We need to re-record our intro and update the early shows to our new quality standards. Or at least fix some errors. For which we have apologized on the site. We were really worried back then when we did those shows. So it's a great time to just look back at them. We have even received a terrible iTunes review because of that. Which isn't nice. And means that we really need to do some updates. And February... Seems like a nice month to finally do so. But for now, on to the episode. I hope that you have caught a certain theme running through this show. It's an identity thing. Just look at our name and our logo, the eastern border, with the EU flag mixed with the Soviet one. We're on the direct border here. Partially civilized, partially still Soviet. At least our politicians are still thinking with that kind of a mentality. Soviet Union changed us, made us rethink our values, put a certain way of thinking in our heads. They have a saying in Russia, Umam Rashiyin Panyach, which means you can't understand Russia with your mind. It's a soul thing, as they say. Same can be easily told about the USSR, where this saying originated. There is also an often misunderstood quote from Vladimir Putin, saying that, quote, whoever does not miss the Soviet Union has no heart. Whoever wants it back has no brain. End quote. The heart is the nostalgia about the people, about the things which made us better, friendlier, craftier people. I'll have to dedicate an episode for all things which were better in the USSR than now at some point even. We wouldn't want it back, though. It was a place full of paradoxes, strange things and seemingly illogical events. A joke explains it all quite well. And it's one of those deep, chokhmah jokes, which make you laugh, but at the same time reveal a certain truth about life in the Soviet Union. The six base paradoxes of socialism. Everybody is working, but there is nothing in the stores. There is nothing in the stores, but everyone has everything. Everyone has everything, 
but nobody is happy. Nobody is happy, but everyone votes for. Everyone votes for, but nobody works. Nobody works, but there's no unemployment. The joke says, base paradoxes, because this is what the USSR was built upon. Soviet Union was nonsensical, tyrannical, and worked on sheer insanity. These paradoxes were also the things which Gorbachev spent every effort to eradicate. The problem was, with the paradoxes no longer being present, there was also no need for the USSR anymore. With them, the Soviet system was inefficient. Without them, it could not exist. Gorbachev tried to understand USSR with a rational, clear mind. It couldn't be done. This is going to be a long tale about a failure. About an honest failure. About how Gorby wholeheartedly and honestly tried to make Soviet Union a better place. And in the end, chose people over the state. So what is his story? Well, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev was born on the 2nd of May 1931 in Privolnye, Stavropol Krai. Russian SFSR. He first-hand experienced the famine of 1932-1933 when he was just a baby. According to his memoirs, half of his village died during that winter, including a lot of his relatives. Imagining what horrors his parents went through to keep him alive is terrible all by itself. But that's not all of his nasty childhood, no. Furthermore, both of his grandfathers were arrested by KGB on false accusations, as he writes, which meant that someone had told something about them to the authorities, or had enemies, or some officer's punishment list was too short, and one of them was exiled to Siberia. This, again, meant that Gorbachev had to study and work really, really hard, as his family was certainly on the non-trusted people list, which made your life really complicated in an already complicated country. Apparently, he managed to excel in school, as he, even while being on this list, managed to get great education. He graduated from Moscow State University in 1955 with a degree in law. Later, in 1967, he qualified as an agricultural economist via a correspondence master's degree at the Stavropol Institute of Agriculture. During his studies, he joined the Communist Party. And it turned out to be a nice career opportunity for him. Steadily moving up in the party ranks, he was appointed first party secretary of the Stavropol Regional Committee in 1970, becoming one of the youngest provincial party chiefs in the nation. He actually did a pretty good job there, and became a member of the Communist Party Central Committee in 1971. In 1979, Gorbachev was elected a candidate member of the Politburo, the highest authority in the country, and received full membership in 1980. A large role here was played by Andropov, which really liked young Gorbachev. He also was friends with Mikhail Suslov, which we've also mentioned in the previous episodes. Just to remind you, Suslov was the chief ideologist of the party. Even Stalin had said that who appoints what holds all the power. Human resources and appointments were extremely important in the USSR which is why, during Andropov's reign, using his privileged position, Gorbachev slowly started replacing the aging regional party leaders with younger people, getting their support, much like Chernenko had done before, but by that time, Chernenko was doing the same thing and building his own power base, so this went past him. But Gorbachev, who was relatively young and energetic, didn't waste any time, and carefully accumulated power within the party. He also managed to do quite a bit of traveling to the Western countries in his career. He had led delegations to Belgium and West Germany, and had visited Canada and Great Britain, meeting Pierre Trudeau and Margaret Thatcher, respectively. Those visits are a great contrast to the old men mentioned in the previous episode, who weren't even able to leave their hospital rooms for the most part. They also left a serious impact on the way Gorby thought. You see, he, for one, actually cared about how the regular Soviet people lived and generally wanted them to live better. But we'll get to that a bit later. For now, about him getting power. You see, after Chernyenko's death, Gorbachev had his final lucky break. 
the remaining old party leaders had also finally decided that someone fresh and not terminally ill should be leading the country. Besides, Gorbachev was an ideal candidate. He had basically done all of Chernenko's work anyway, and thus, using both votes from his own people and from the aging old guard, Gorbachev was elected general secretary by the Politburo on 11th March 1985, only three hours after Chernenko's death. Upon his ascension at age 54, he was the youngest member of the Politburo. Also, he was the first Soviet leader who was born after the October Revolution. The Pravda, that came out the next day, held articles about both Chernenko's death and Gorbachev's election on the same page. Which, of course, caused a lot of people to wonder what was going on. And, obviously, everyone knew that the election had been completely prearranged before. And most likely that was true. Then again, by now it wasn't anything unusual, to be honest. So, we've got Gorby's early life and rise to power covered. Now, what about the state he inherited? We have spent eight episodes talking about this, so you should know by now. But here's a quick recap for you. The economy is in a massive stagnation because of Khrushchev's crazy experiments and Brezhnev's various military activities and incompetent rule. All legitimacy of the Soviet state is gone. The people have basically stopped taking it seriously anymore. Cold War has escalated again thanks to Andropov, Chernenko and, yes, Ronald Reagan. There is massive corruption in the system with nepotism and blatant theft everywhere which has come with a massive disillusionment about life in general. And the prohibition is just kicking in. Now, what Gorbachev actually did while he was in office. We're lucky enough to have a lot of interviews and a book written by him explaining his actions. The book mentioned in the early episodes is called Perestroika and the New Way of Thinking for Our Country and the Whole World and was published in 1987. It's a great start, and allows us to see the thoughts of a general secretary about what's actually going on in the country. Mind you, it's a very fun read, but it's full with lies and propaganda as well. It's a complicated book, which is why we took such a long time to actually get there. You need to know some things about how we got to this part before we can look at Gorbachev's book, analyze it, and compare it to reality. Firstly, Gorby spends a whole chapter explaining to the readers what exactly had happened in the USSR and why any such perestroika, or reconstruction in English, is necessary. Now, excuse me, but for clarity's sake, I'll call it by the more popular known original term, perestroika, as reconstruction is a much wider, less specific term that can potentially cause confusion. Now, what he's basically trying to do here is to talk about what I've been telling you about on this show, but without losing face or dignity which, I have to admit, must have been a difficult task for the general secretary. This is important, because the audience included both people in the Soviet Union and the Western countries, as this book was written by request of an American publisher. And, as much as Gorbachev knew what was going on in the country, he had to be polite about it. Surprisingly enough, he manages to pull this off quite well, Blaming the poor economical decisions made in the 70s by Brezhnev, he writes that, quote, Due to the fact that we've evaluated everything so far only by the percentage of the plan, we had focused ourselves on acquiring only the brutto result, the amount of steel produced, cars built, and the like, forgetting about efficiency and quality. Such implementations were deemed to be less valuable than just fulfilling the regular plan. And thus, we've arrived to a situation where the brilliant Soviet scientists invent a fundamentally new machine for our factories, but it gets implemented in the USA and Japan way before our own factories. He gets spot on with the utter and complete inefficiency. But the fact that tremendously costly and huge projects are being built all the time, just so that the builders and engineers could note in their plan that they've built something huge and expensive not really thinking about the fact that what they're building is already obsolete, or is on its way on to being obsolete. Also, of course, the USSR spent way more raw resources per unit of production than any other developed country due to this inefficiency, which was only made worse by the ever-present corruption and theft. But why would the worker try harder? Why would the factory director implement any innovations? 
They're paid only by the amount that they produce, not by quality or efficiency, with some very tiny exceptions. And, even if someone decides to innovate, then it has to go through a lengthy approval process in the party and various committees, and you might even end up being punished in the end. It was much easier to just do like everyone else. Waste a mass of resources and do a sloppy job in wherever you worked. And, in in your spare time, well, just do things that benefit yourself. I'll illustrate this with a theoretical example. Now, imagine that you work in a factory that produces men's clothing. You have a certain amount of cloth from which you have to sew a certain amount of shirts. The patterns you are given for actually sewing the things are terribly inefficient and waste a lot of good usable cloth, which then just gets thrown out. Now, the logical thing in every normal economical system for a smart, energetic worker would be to draw better patterns, go to the administration, put these patterns, and receive a raise or a promotion. Or, even better, take a loan and make a more efficient, better men's clothing factory. Now, the second option was obviously just purely illegal in the USSR. The first one would get you reprimanded, because the paperwork and the legal trouble to get that done would be insane, and it would take years and cause much headache for the administration. So, what actually happened was that your shift leader would come up to you and say something in the lines of, look, all that extra cloth is getting officially discarded, right? And the shirts are going to the army anyways, we're making a deficit here. So, like all of us, use your own patterns and save up cloth. Then, make extra shirts from the cloth and hand them to me. I know people who know people, and will trade them for some extra stuff. Oh, and I know that your cousin fixes cars, and our comrade director Svolg just broke down. So, you know, go fix that one, give him a bottle of vodka, and we'll keep doing things smoothly. Now, I can't assure you that exactly this conversation happened somewhere, but all the satire newspapers were criticizing this, there were serious lectures held in the Kolkhoz culture houses and factory red corners about this. And everyone I know who happened to work in some Soviet factory during the time have told me a variation about how stuff like this happened in their place. So, it did happen, everyone knew about it, but nobody really gave a damn, because everyone benefited. Except the people in the very high echelons of government, of course, like our friend Gorbachev, who suddenly couldn't get his economical data to make sense anymore. So, here's what he did to try to fix this. First off, like mentioned in the last episode, enforce the prohibition. Imagine this, take the real, actually used currency away from the people, and force them to use the worthless paper rubles, and you control the population. Well, okay, Gorbachev wasn't that evil. He actually cared about the people. Nonetheless, the idea remains there. And, as we've already covered this previously, let's move on to the other things. Quality. A little background on this is needed. USSR had implemented a state-signed quality mark in 1967 to denote goods that had a, quote, higher quality category, unquote. The right to use the sign, the mark, was leased to the enterprises for two, three years based on the examination of the goods by the State Attestation Commission. Or, so they tell me the proper translation is. In Russian, is, in Russian it's Государственная Аттестационная Комиссия. Technically, according to their documentation, that meant that the production made by the said enterprise should meet the following standards. <clears throat> Quote, it meets or exceeds the quality of the best international analogs. The parameters of the quality are stable. The goods fully satisfy Soviet state standards. The goods are compatible with international standards. Production of goods is economically effective, and they satisfy the demands of the state economy and the population. End quote. Now, sounds really good, doesn't it? A bit too good to be true. Well, as nicely defined in the guidebook. Rabochemu akachestve metala obrobotke, or to the worker about the quality of metalworking, written by a bureaucrat with whose name I won't even bother you with, the sign itself is a pentagonal shield with a rotated letter K from the word kachestve, 
quality in Russian. Stylized as scales below the below the Cyrillic abbreviation of SSSR. But if this excellent description doesn't satisfy you, you're always welcome to visit our website or our Facebook page and take a look for yourself, as we have posted it there. Now, this quality marking actually worked in the beginning. Putting this sign on your production allowed to increase the price of the produced things by 10%, which made no sense in the socialist economy, except that the size of the premiums paid by the state was also determined by the amount of money paid, again, to the state, by the factory. And this allowed to gain extra revenue without doing anything. Because it's not like the Soviet people had any choice in, for example, what boots or different shirts were available in the store. Quality marker now. So, of course, crafty Soviet factory and kolkhoz directors quickly understood that the members of the commission sent check on the quality of their goods. Well, whether or not they actually are so good as the standards say, are just as corrupt as everyone else, yeah, and that it was much, much easier to just get them drunk, toss them a huge party, bribe them with stuff, maybe take them to a hunt, and get the mark that way, rather than producing actual quality stuff. Now, all of this, by the way, in times with a catastrophic lack of food again, Moscow was well supplied, at the expense of everyone else, and people were pretty pissed off about the lack of meat, cheese, and basically everything. And Riga was in a relatively good situation, even. It was much worse in other parts of the gigantic Soviet state. So, when the mark of quality became a joke, and the ever-increasing plant quotas made the factories, even those with the mark, to produce even lower quality things than before, Gorbachev stepped in, and introduced new reforms. Namely, he used his new people in the administration to actually check the assigned factories for their quality, changed how the premiums were given to workers, actually including quality in the equitation, and to save the USSR's face a bit, created a new brand, made in the USSR, which was meant for export markets. This one wasn't as special or epic, it was just words made in the USSR added on things. Now, these things were actually excellently made, but obviously very rare in the USSR itself, which made anything with the brand on it basically a fashion statement in itself and the status symbol. And, weirdly enough, quite often smuggled in the USSR from East Germany, where the quality of life was much higher. Besides, you really couldn't be put to prison for owning something actually made in the USSR. So, not only these goods were actually good, but they were also safe, which was very important to the Soviet citizen. The third thing which Gorbachev did was quite radical. Firstly, in 1986, Certain forms of collective enterprises were somewhat recognized. The system was quite schizophrenic, because for a while, it was hanging in the jurisdictional limbo, as having limited businesses were legal, but at the same time, nobody had cancelled the criminal punishments for them. For speculation, basically, as it was defined in the Soviet Criminal Code, which meant basically any private trading whatsoever, as it was completely illegal to buy anything for cheap and sell it for more expensive. Now, this was sort of fixed, and I say sort of, when the cooperative law was declared in the later days of the USSR, in 1988, which legally allowed semi-capitalistic private enterprises a bit more free from the central control to be created in certain fields of economy. By then, the previous reforms had already failed spectacularly, and although Gorbachev was by no means interested in turning the Soviet Union into a capitalistic society, he did understand that some liberation of economy was absolutely necessary to save by then already collapsing state. These ideas seem nice, right? Well, together with the changes in the administrative apparatus, especially the whole getting the new reformers in positions of power part, these form the core of the perestroika. Yeah, Gorbachev liked them too, you know. In his book, he writes, quote, The Soviet people are convinced... As a result of perestroika and democratization, our land shall become richer and stronger. Life shall become better. I repeat, there are and will be troubles during the process of perestroika, sometimes even large and difficult, and we are not hiding this fact. But we shall deal with them. We are certain about that. End quote. 
A popular joke running after the collapse was that if by we, in this sentence, Gorbachev meant the Soviet people, instead members of Politburo, then technically he was right. We dealt with the difficulties, along with the system. Besides the obvious prohibition bypassing, about which I talked in the last episode, there were some other things which I shall explain now. Firstly, the new higher quality control of the marks worked. Again, initially. It was soon discovered that a lot of the new inspectors were just as corrupt as the old ones. And on many occasions, they literally were the old inspectors. You see, change in administration was nice, and actually did bring some changes, but the inspectors were just random clerks appointed by the said administration. And why would you randomly fire a guy who's been working in there for 15 years, and is, well, decent, and the ordinary paperwork always gets done in time? Kind of. And he's about to retire anyways in a few years? Sorta? Well, you see where I'm going with this. Also, the new bureaucracy and the remnants of the old administration were not always completely loyal, which caused a lot of issues and stress for Gorbachev, especially in the tragic Chernobyl incident, about which I should definitely make a separate episode. (laughs) In fact, I'll, I'll probably make my next episode about it. So yeah, the cooperative law was originally intended so that the retired people could sell their knitted sweaters and homegrown tulips or souvenirs in small flea markets. Gorbachev liked this idea, and it made sense, as everyone had a job and received state-paid salaries. Only people with free time would do it, you know? And only retired people had free time, right? Wrong. Now, I must warn you, I am delving in the identity questions now, because these cooperatives are what later became our first businesses, and somewhat defined the economical situation in Eastern Bloc in the 90s and a lot of our modern-day influential politicians came from these cooperatives, and the Communist Party, of course. So, treading dangerous waters here. Listeners, beware. So, what happened was that the cooperative business was completely completely dominated by people who legalized, in quotes, their previously illegal factory-attached side businesses, which I described earlier. Now, following our previous example they would buy cloth legally from the factory. At least on paper. Because, obviously, thefts continued. Because bribing the director was always cheaper. Now, they did have to buy some materials officially, but not much. As these things weren't very well regulated, with the ever-present corruption playing a major role. The cunning businessmen were able to get away with pretty much anything. Also, these cooperatives benefited the people, but not the state in general, because although factories outproduced them by far, nothing was sold locally and was of poor quality. Cooperatives produced things that were much better and were available locally. Obviously, the demand was huge, so this system made some people extremely wealthy. Of course, it was a very risky business with tons of competition and crime involved, which led to the 90s here, being dominated by organized crime and mob, But there were some people who really, really made it. If you had done something illegally before, like selling the self-grown tulips or taking money from people to get them seated in a restaurant or something, you were just the guy for the task. At that time, it wasn't about education or business skills. It was about knowing how to cheat the law, about intuition, contacts, and sometimes blind luck. And when Gorbachev lacks the border control and import laws, a lot of people started making a lot of money on the insane price differences of deficit goods here and in the West. When I'm talking about the West, I mean mostly Poland and and East Germany, though. Now, Janis Zenis, currently University of Latvia Center of Optometrics Financial Director and an Associated Professor of the Latvian Institute of Solid State Physics, who was closely involved with the cooperatives in that time, talks about this in an interview to a Latvian business magazine, Nedelja. Quote, During the Soviet era, we had lost the basis of our economic education, which everyone should acquire with their mother's milk. Deposit, liquidity, supply and demand, even such basic things, normally understood business terms hadn't existed here for decades. Because of that, everyone was taking crazy risks, doing semi-legal and often illegal things without the very basic understanding of how honest business even works. 
of course, organized crime spread like wildfire. End quote. He also talks about how if you decided to import, for example, high-quality plastic handbags from Poland, where they got them from East Germany, and sell them on the central market here in Riga, making a crazy profit, no less, because of the deficit and the price differences, you could make a lot of money. But just as likely, people from KGB could find something wrong with your enterprise and arrest you. Or demand a bribe. Or, even worse, some muscled people could just come up and ask for the very classical protection money. Or maybe warn you that the person in this market selling plastic bags this week is Igor, who's standing in that there far corner, and that you should go get lost. And they would take your plastic bags. Or they could just break your legs and take your plastic bags that way. I'm just talking about plastic bags here, but think about how it was for more serious cooperatives. There were guys like the quite well-known cooperative Forum, who sold train rails, most likely borrowed, and other metal junk in Poland, and brought back ZX Spectrum ripoffs and antiquated Macintosh computers. Which is why I've worked with the ZX Spectrum analog and that old Macintosh SC. You know, that little box which had um, an 8-inch eight eight inch black and white screen? Yeah, I saw that when I was a kid. Because my stepfather worked in a newspaper, and they had bought some to make their work easier. Which was rare at the time. Now, this whole computer thing, this is big business for the time. Of course, relatively, because, ten because the business practices tended to go out of hand very quickly, and there were people stealing and moving whole trains with oil and coal abroad even. But still, these computer, business computer parts were quite big. Now, according to what the involved people have told me personally, they paid up to 30% of their revenue in various bribes and to the organized crime. All deals happened in cash. And nobody moved anywhere without a loaded shotgun or a Makarov, which was still completely legal, obviously, on their passenger's seat. And now, understand that quite a lot of our politicians, for a long while, came from this culture and what impact it has had in Latvia and in our region in general. This changed a bit when they joined the EU, but there are still quite a few of them in power. More so in the ex-Soviet countries, which are not a part of the EU. Like Russia or Ukraine. Trying to do something about this ingrained political culture, where normal economical relations are replaced by criminal relationships and blatant theft and nepotism, is, in my opinion, also one of the reasons why the recent revolution in Ukraine happened. Estonia has had it the best from all the Baltic countries, by the way, because they didn't allow the old elites to stay in power when the USSR collapsed. Well, we in Latvia did. But that's a story for another episode. So, you see, Gorbachev really tried to implement changes in the system, keeping socialism alive. But, because we had no idea about how business works, about how it's like to do anything, we just rushed, a lo we just rushed headlong into craziness. And by doing that drag the Soviet economy with us. And then there was glasnost, or clarity. That's the process of democratization that Gorbachev began, along with perestroika. He also, also mentioned in that previous quote I read to you. Gorby had wanted to improve the administrative apparatus, the bureaucracy, cut down the red tape a bit from the very beginning of his ascent to power. He tried to make this idea real in 1988, when he announced this policy of openness. Suddenly free, well, again, sort of. Press was allowed, people were allowed to participate in public organizations, mostly green, ecological ones, like Latvian Nature Protection Club, or Vidasaisardzibis clubs, which served as one of the pillars of our independence movement. Thousands of political prisoners were released from Andropov's asylums, and people were encouraged to criticize the government. This also led to our first semi-democratic elections in 1990, and later, obviously, independence and collapse of the USSR. Now, I shall spend a whole future episode on the independence movements and the collapse of the USSR. But for now, it's very important to understand what did Gorbachev mean when he was writing and talking about the democratization of the Soviet Union. Because again, it's an identity question, and it's quite paradoxical, to be honest. You see, Gorbachev thought that it was the return to the very beginning of everything. That is, to Lenin. Yes, for Gorbachev, 
Lenin represents democracy. He writes in his book, quote, We have learned and are learning from Lenin a creative approach to the theory and practice of socialism building, using in our armament his scientific methodology and using his skills of analysis when dealing with problematic situations. That just shows how important Lenin was to him. Now, we're talking here about a person who had condemned millions to death after he gained power in the Soviet Union, about a person who participated in the Civil War, and a person who has repeatedly stated that he would sooner see the whole nation die of hunger than allow free trade and grain. At the same time, while official Soviet reports were admitting that fully 30 million Soviet citizens were in danger of death by starvation. In short, Lenin and his comrades knew with substantial certainty that their policies would cause widespread death from starvation. Now, how is that related to democracy? Gorby thought that people wanted socialism, that is their choice. Choice of death by starvation? Maybe. But he also thought that people wanted change, but that they wanted to remain in socialism. And he cared about the people, much more than Lenin, I might add, and wanted to make this idea of improving socialism available to them, as he saw the biggest problem with the whole country was that it was controlled by the elites, who didn't really understand what socialism is, and what that means to the people. That was the socialism with a human face. That was also Gorbachev's biggest political mistake. Because a lot of people really didn't want socialism. Gorbachev allowed political movements and some freedom of voting because he thought that people would still vote for communists and that it would give the regime some legitimacy. And the global political situation in the world also had changed. The Soviet state just wasn't what it used to be, and the world had globalized. Late 80s saw the very beginnings of the age of information. Media was now everywhere. It was very hard to hide things from the global society. Again, I shall talk about this in the next episode dedicated to Chernobyl, but the USSR couldn't hide things as well as before, and nor could oppose the USA-led free world as easily as before. It needed to adapt or die, and Gorbachev sincerely thought the people would choose the former. And this is a paradox again. He gave people what they wanted based on the assumptions that they wanted something completely different. <laughs> this man is really complicated. And, of course, all of Gorby's policies were firmly represented in the political anecdotes about the period. It seems interesting to look at the Soviet jokes as a source, because they nicely show what, what it was like for the common people. For one, here's one about Glasnost. <clears throat> we say Lenin, but think party. We say party, but think Lenin. And so, for 70 years, we say one thing, but think another. It nicely shows the zeitgeist. People were tired. Everything was lies, and what they publicly stated, what Gorbachev saw, because he had a few other sources, was just partially true, which made him make his mistakes. If everyone says that they're supporters of communism, but really just care about going home from work early to possibly stand in a huge queue to get some sausage, they won't exactly be the most trustworthy voters if you give them access to a real choice in the ballot box. And talking about lack of things, this capitalization of society, perestroika, started to introduce real prices to the markets. Everything was underpriced before, it just wasn't there. But now? Well, now you could get things from the cooperatives, but they cost what, the, what their market value was, not what the state demanded them to cost. And, as almost nobody, even the people involved in the cooperatives, knew how a market society works, this, of course, caused quite a lot of misunderstandings and disappointment in the population. The strangest thing was that, at the time, people thought that things were getting more expensive because we are doing this in a socialist system, not because of any market forces. They thought that when we'd move to a fully capitalistic society, things would be hard at first, yes, but they would get cheaper again. Which obviously didn't happen, and it didn't happen as fast as we had expected, which is why the early transition years were especially terrible. But for now, they made, they made jokes like this one. During Lenin's era, it was like in the metro. 
darkness everywhere, one light bulb in front. During Stalin's time, it was like in the bus. Half are sitting, the other half are shaking. During Brezhnev's era, it was like in an airplane. One person is driving the thing, and everyone else wants to vomit. During Gorbachev's rule, it's like in a taxi now. The further we go, the more expensive it is. Yeah, uh, sitting here in the Stalin's era basically is a slang term for being in prison. If you didn't catch that one. Now, and as the, as the multi-party system was introduced in the very late period of the Soviet existence, the people who were getting elected now actually had to worry about their electorate and their opinion. Which was obviously never a good idea, because by that time everyone had grown really, really tired of the Soviet state. So here's another one for you. An MP candidate is meeting with the voters. A question from the auditorium arrives. Is it true that your grandfather participated in the storming of the Winter Palace and was a hero of the revolution? Candidate suddenly blushes, his assistant runs to the podium and gets very, very angry. <clears throat> and replies to the question. A grandson should not pay for the deeds of a grandfather. And a final one. <clears throat> I'm sorry for, for the quantity of those, but I think that they just really represent what was going on. So, and a final one. About the media and how Gorby couldn't hide anything anymore. Gorbachev stands on the balcony and is smoking a cigarette. His wife, Raisa, shouts to him from the kitchen. Misha, Misha, are you smoking in just your underpants again? Gorby is surprised. Why, why, yes, how do you know that, my dear? Another shout from the kitchen. I just reported that on the BBC News. As you can hear from this, the political jokes have turned from shy, depressive self-depreciation to almost outright mockery of the Soviet state. Perestroika gave that small taste of capitalism to the people again. That burger was back. Sure, it was extremely expensive now, but it was there. And Glasnost gave people the courage and the freedom of information that they needed so much to actually to be able to use it. Now, we shall obviously take a deeper look on this in the future, but first, while we're at it in this time period, I'm going to have to explain the Chernobyl catastrophe because that was both the reason why the first ecological public groups were allowed, and because this event was so traumatic and important that I just cannot miss it, which we'll do next time. And that's it for today's show. Thank you for listening. Sorry about the long wait. I remind you that we'll be out mid-February next time, and we'll have fixed our older episodes by the end of February. And maybe we'll create something a little extra for our Patreon supporters. Oh, and we'll be sending out the second batch of pins and souvenirs too, just so you know. Until next time, comrades. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.